When I retired and settled in Nova Scotia years ago, I never dreamt that I would enjoy the level of success I've had as a woodcarver. Hello, my name is Al Durham, and I would like to share with you today what I have learned over the last 30 years as a woodcarver. Although I can carve and shape almost any wood, each kind of wood has its own characteristics, such as the difference in hardness, the color, and the amount of grain. I also have to consider other factors, such as the cost and availability of each kind of wood. Woods such as basswood, pine, and butternut are on the softer side and are easy to work with. Basswood and pine, you'll notice, have a less distinct grain compared to butternut. Hardwoods too have different kinds of grain. Cherry and maple are examples of hardwoods with a tight grain. Oak, on the other hand, has a more open grain and requires different carving techniques. One of the charms of working with wood is the variety in every piece I touch, even amongst wood of the same type. On my journey through life, I've had the chance to carve wood from different areas of the world. For example, I've carved prairie diamond willow, British Columbia cedar, California redwood, Texas mesquite, Louisiana cypress, Caribbean mahogany, New Zealand cowrie, and South Asian teak. There is no end to what can be carved in wood, and here are some examples. Using only carving knives, I've carved many caricatures. They are fun to make, and people really enjoy them. People often find it hard to believe that these fish are actually carved from wood, but they are. To understand how to replicate the thrust of a fish's tail, I often use a simple paper pattern. The airbrushing technique helps to bring the fish to life. Some of these fish carvings have won competitions in Nova Scotia and as far away as British Columbia. Over the years, I have carved various birds. Here is a group of chickadees and nuthatches which were hand-painted and mounted on driftwood. The feathers on the sculptures of the Canadian goose and the peregrine falcon look even more realistic than the chickadees because each individual feather is painstakingly carved in detail and then wood burned for realism prior to being hand painted with special paints. One day, years ago, I was asked to assist a local boat builder to add carved features to the yachts that he was building. As a result, some of my work is constantly on the move, crisscrossing global waterways. I have carved many signs over the last 25 years, and many are still being used today. Since they have to endure the elements year-round, they were designed with preservation in mind while still balancing the need to make the carvings as detailed and as intricate as possible. Besides carving various religious statues for our local church, I also donated other carvings for charity. As a side note, I was asked to see if, if I might be able to repair three statues for churches, even though technically this isn't wood carving. I rebuilt one statue's head. I repaired another by carving a new hand. And I restored yet another statue whose paint job was in disrepair. These canes with the uniquely carved handles were actually the roots of saplings taken from the ground while I was clearing some land. And the actual carved handles were from the roots of the tree. This piece of mahogany started out at this length. 
and through a series of precision cuts, drilled holes, we were able to come up with a ball inside a double moving cage. And so you see that the ball remains inside. We'll roll back and forth. All one piece. These spoons can be a great addition to a musical jam session. Sometimes I make a clay model before I actually do the wood carving. While other times I start with a photo, then do the clay models, and then the actual wood carving. Another way to start a carving is to begin with actual human models and sketches. Two huge blocks of laminated western cedar, each weighing over 250 pounds, were delivered to my workshop. As always in wood carving, the object is to remove the excess wood that you do not want and leave behind what you do want. I first use a chainsaw to remove large amounts of excess wood. Next, I used impact chisels driven by a compressor. More shaping was done by large hand chisels. And for the final sculpting, I used a variety of smaller chisels. Then the two sculptures were loaded on a truck and transported to the worksite where they were sealed with a preservative and installed under the eaves of the house. As previously shown, some carvings were hand-painted, others, like the fish, were airbrushed. Still, other carvings were given a clear coat to show off the natural wood grain. When I carve a bust, I apply a paste wax and buff it to a high finish. In the case of the rocking horses, the bodies were hand painted white. I then used a sponge technique to make the black markings on their bodies. To finish off, they were each given handmade leather saddles, a mane and a tail. In the case of the smaller horse, the saddle came from Mexico and the mane and the tail were made from real horsehair. I find that the skills I have learned with wood carving and painting are easily transferable to other mediums. For example, carving bark, moose antlers, pumpkins, soapstone, plywood cutouts, airbrushing the wheel covers on recreational vehicles. I've also etched a mirror, plexiglass, and the inside of a motorcycle windshield. And I also do wood burning. We've all walked through the woods and we've noticed at times fungus growing on the side of trees. When that fungus is removed from the tree, and dried, the undersurface can be used for texturing with wood carving of scenes of your choice. <laughs> 